Hello and welcome to Washington Talk, I'm Eun Jung Chao. Amid rising tensions between Washington and Tehran, President Trump authorized the killing of Iran's top general, Qasem Soleimani. A few days later, he sends a birthday message to the North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un. How will these events impact denuclearization talks with North Korea? By removing Soleimani, we have sent a powerful message to terrorists. If you value your own life, you will not threaten the lives of our people. And we'll exercise our right to self-defense, should that become necessary, once again. In the studio with me today, Ms. Jenny Town, fellow at the Stimson Center. Ms. Town is also the managing editor of the 38 North, a website providing policy and technical analysis on North Korea. Also joining me, Mr. Scott Snyder, director of U.S.-Korea policy program at the Council on Foreign Relations. His latest book, South Korea at the Crossroads, charts the evolution of South Korean foreign policy and strategic choices. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Now, uh, Ms. Town, so the killing of the Iranian General Soleimani, is this a warning to North Korea that U.S. may take military actions against North Korea? I don't know if it's necessarily a warning to North Korea. Um, and it's certainly not the first time that North Korea has seen the U.S. take action in the Middle East since Trump has been in power. Um, I, I think, if anything, it just underscores the, the mistrust that North Korea has of U.S. intentions and what would happen if they pre preemptively or prematurely give up their, their nuclear deterrent. Mm -hmm. um, they've seen this happen in the past of U.S. intervention in Iraq, in Libya. They've seen the fate of governments and leaders that the U.S. disagrees with. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, they see this, I think, more as a reinforcing the view of why they need their self-defense and why they need the nuclear deterrent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Will this feed into the North Korea's paranoia about a possible U.S. decapitation um, operation against its leader? Well, I do think that the strike blurs the lines in terms of uh, the convention, in terms of what the U.S. has been willing to do in the past. Um, it, it crosses the line from a non-state actor uh, targeted uh, by the U.S. to a state actor. And so that is going to raise questions, I think, about uh, President Trump and what he might do uh, in terms of other cases where we're dealing with um, uh, entities or states that are categorized as enemies of the United mm -hmm. States. Mm -hmm. So on January 8th, President Trump was delivering a speech on um, Iran's situation, and that was the day when South Korea's National Security Advisor Chong Young was visiting the White House. And according to Mr. Chong, President Trump called him and wanted him to deliver a message to um, Kim Jong-un for his birthday, celebrating his birthday. So um, is this a clear indication that President Trump have different approaches regarding Iran and North Korea? Well, that's a complicated question, I think, because uh, National Security Advisor Chang, um, in some ways, I think uh, that the whole issue of the birthday and the transmittal uh, of um, uh, congratulations on Kim Jong-un's birthday is also about trying to get South Korea back into the game. Uh, after all, South Korea is the one that uh, was designated to transmit that particular message. But it's also true that uh, Trump has a relationship with Kim. Uh, the North Koreans responded and opened a channel. Uh, Trump, I think, has tried to reach out to uh, the leadership in Iran on a number of occasions uh, in a very similar fashion to the way that he's reached out uh, to North Korea, and the Iranians, Iranians never responded. Mm -hmm. How did you see it? Um, President Trump wanting to send a birthday message to North Korea. Will this revive the stalled denuclearization talks? No, I don't think it'll revive the stalled talks. You know, the, the Iran relationship with Trump starting by 
exiting the JCPOA really set it off on the wrong foot. So being um, reaching out to Iran afterwards is, is really kind of hollow words for the Iranians. But it also shows that this was Obama's initiative, and, and Trump has always been a little bit antagonistic to that to begin with, whereas North Korea was Obama's failure. And this was, you know, Trump's opportunity to really um, make progress on an issue that Obama couldn't do. And so I think he's really approached this as this is his potential win. And he's going to protect this um, and preserve this relationship as long as he can to try and engineer that kind of, of political win for himself. Mm -hmm. So given that kind of different relationship between U.S. and Iran and U.S. and North Korea, is it a stretch to hypothesize that similar attacks on North Korean general may be um, considered in the future? Well, I, I don't think you can rule anything out, right? And I don't think the North Koreans rule anything out. They, they have been part of the axis of evil that tied Iran, Iraq, and North Korea together in the past. Um, I think you saw even in the party plenum speech, um, Kim Jong-un did actually use the phrase axis of evil as well. So I think they see this as anything as possible. Um, it, they have deep mistrust of the United States. This is not going to remedy that mistrust. Um, so whether or not the U.S. really has plans, and the U.S. has always talked about having all options and considering all options. And so I think, you know, the North Koreans will plan for any contingency um, while still trying to maintain a relationship um, to see what else is possible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, Mr. Snyder, I've been talking to constitutional law scholars, and they say although they disagree whether the, it was illegal or illegal to take out Soleimani, in similar cases against North Korea, it is legal because the Korean War never ended, and North Korea is in war with America. So, um, back in 2017, there were talks of um, U.S.'s preventive attack against North Korea and the rumors of a the bloody nose strike. What was the reaction back then from the public and the policy circle? Well, I think that within policy circles, uh, this was very actively debated. I don't think that it really seeped out into the public um, consciousness uh, at that time. Uh, and you'll recall that uh, we had a, an ambassador designate, Victor Cha, who actually got pulled back on the pretext uh, of opposition uh, to the idea of some kind of military action against North Korea. So it was a very live debate at that time. Um, you know, the connection between Iran and North Korea as related to uh, discussions about use of military force uh, has been there for a long time, even back to the Persian Gulf War. Uh, because, you know, back during the George W. Bush administration, we had a situation where the U.S. took military action against Iraq. There was a lot of discussion of shock and awe. Uh, and I think that at a certain uh, period of time in 2003, it actually looked like the U.S. might march to Baghdad and then move to Pyongyang. Mm -hmm. But of course, we got stalled out. And what was notable about the spring of 2003 is also that Kim Jong-il kind of laid low for over a month. Uh, he made himself scarce. Uh, and so I think that the fear uh, in North Korea of a potential strike was real at that time. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Town, um, Iran said that its retaliation against America is over, but um, with the Middle Eastern issue, would that divert President Trump's attention away from North Korea this year? It's hard to predict these kinds of things and, and to see what the fallout is really going to be, even if the official fighting might be over. Um, certainly, it's bred a lot of ill will in the Middle East and it revives some of the more um, fundamentalist, extremist uh, uh, notions. It's, it's highly possible that this could get bogged down and that the administration could get distracted by this. Um, it's highly possible that the North Koreans might be okay with that right now because they are trying to work on institutional reform and industry reform and, and Kim Jong-un set forth a lot of tasks to the economy and to the leaders um, to deal with on a domestic level. Um, but we do also know that the North Koreans don't like to be ignored. Um, and that there may be a point where they sort of force our hand as well and remind us that they're there and that they're, they should also be of high priority. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, what happens next is, is really anyone's guess at this point. Mm -hmm. So the, the choice that the North Koreans end up having in a moment like this is whether or not uh, they want to take advantage of U.S. Uh, uh, change in direction of attention toward Iran uh, by being a spoiler or by being a counterpart. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and if North Korea wants to be a spoiler, then our um, change in direction of attention is an opportunity. If they want to be a counterpart, then it's a real problem because uh, all of the U.S. attention is focused on Iran and there's simply not enough space to be able to mount uh, an effective and sustained diplomatic attention at the top level mm -hmm. to North Korea. Mm -hmm. At least in the short run, that this is going to mean that they're going to try, you know, hunker down on their views, double down on their nuclear weapons. Um, how long that lasts, I think, depends on what happens in the next few months as well. And so there may be a time before the elections where they do decide to come back to the table and try and get something done with Trump before, before the elections. Mm -hmm. um, but it's certainly in the short term, you know, this is going to really, it would be hard for them to come to the table with open arms. Um, when something like this just happened. Mm -hmm. Before we go, um, Mr. Snyder, so Ambassador to Korea, Harry Harris, in an interview with the local media, said that South Korea should send troops to the Strait of Hormuz. So why is America making such requests at this time, and how difficult will this decision be to South Korea? Yeah, well, first, I'm not sure that the U.S. has yet made official requests to its allies. Certainly, the U.S. is active in sounding out the possibility of uh, like-minded nation contributions to activities in the Straits of Hormuz. Uh, and frankly, I think that the response has been kind of mixed. Mm -hmm. It's probably complicated by the latest developments. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've also seen a very interesting debate within South Korea about what to do. And I'm sure that informally, the Blue House is mapping out its choices and options with regard to the possibility of making a contribution mm -hmm. at the same time that we're also talking about the uh, Special Measures Agreement. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so what I see there is uh, the South Koreans already have a presence in the Gulf of Aden as part of an anti-piracy task force. And I think there is a possibility that if the South Korean government decides to make a contribution, uh, that uh, that uh, mission would be repurposed and applied to the Straits of Hormuz uh, with the destroyer that's already present in the Gulf of Aden. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll leave our conversation here and now watch video for our next discussion. Chairman Kim turned 36 years old on January 8th, and this is his ninth year in office. Upon assuming power, Chairman Kim promised that North Koreans would no longer have to tighten their belts. But this year, he again called on his people to be ready for belt tightening. So, Mr. Snyder, is um, Chairman Kim currently facing the biggest challenge, the biggest crisis since he took office? Well, I think you've put your finger on the challenge that he faces, uh, and that is uh, a challenge of economic problems that seem to be mounting. And so I think that that's one aspect of the challenge that he faces, is that the uh, party plenum document clearly shows uh, signs of retrenchment, reversion to central planning, uh, a, a fairly frank admission of the economic difficulties that are being faced. But I think that the other aspect of the challenge that Kim Jong-un faces is still related to the, uh, the hangover from the failure of the Hanoi summit. Uh, and that really is a political failure, which we saw for the first time a North Korean leader experiencing a situation in which he took a bold public diplomatic action, but basically the action failed. Uh, and that, I think, reverberates uh, in North Korea still. I think the evidence of reverberation was kind of between the lines in the party plan document. Mm -hmm. it, it's really now also a challenge of expectation management because since he's taken power, he really has raised expectations about economic prosperity and economic progress. Um, and I, I think he saw the diplomatic opening as a shortcut to, to achieving that. And I think the bold steps that he was taking, that was the expectation, is that this would get him those results faster. Um, now he has to go back and manage those expectations down. 
Um, before he came to power, you know, expectations on economic growth were really, if we're maintaining or doing a little bit better, we're good. But once you start raising those expectations, it's really hard to, to get them back under control in a way that doesn't um, upset the people. And so I think that's really the biggest challenge he has now. Mm -hmm. So the new social elites in North Korea, the Donjus, the money masters who rose in the time of Kim Jong-un's um, rule, um, what was their role during the sanctions regime and what will be their future roles? Well, I think that one effect of sanctions is that it blocks financial flows. Uh, and so in some ways it makes the role of the Tonju more uh, important, but it also makes it much more circumscribed because if you're gonna be a Tonju, you have to have good political connections and you have to have access to financial capital. Uh, and if you're in an environment of scarcity with regard to availability of financial capital, then there are going to be fewer people who can play that role. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, Ms. Town, so 2020 is the last year for North Korea's five-year economic development. And North Korea has not been mentioning this since um, last year's Kim Jong-un's New Year speech. So has North Korea given up on this plan, do you think? Well, I, I don't think they're accomplishing the goals that they laid out. And I think it's a little unclear what those goals were because they, they didn't issue the text of, of what that five-year plan was. Um, the New Year's speech isn't necessarily where they talk about the five-year plan. Um, it will be really interesting to see in their next budget readout and how they do, whether they introduce a new plan and whether some of the directives that were stated in the party plenum speech are integrated into that plan um, because he did set some specific goals and some specific timelines for those goals as well. So I don't think they've given up on economic planning. I think, you know, again, the, the diplomatic process came up rather suddenly and I don't think they anticipated that when they started the five-year plan. So I think they're recalibrating now and trying to figure out how to move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and Mr. Snyder, do you think that 2012, the agriculture reform, can that be cited as another failed attempt to revive the economy? It's hard to say yet whether it is a failed attempt, but I think that what we can see from the party plenum documents uh, is that there's a reversion to central planning. Uh, and that bodes ill, I think, for private sector-led agricultural reform efforts or for space for farmers at the individual level to be able to engage in private interchange. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I worry about most. Uh, just like uh, under Kim Jong-il in 2002, we saw the announcement of partial economic reforms, uh, but then by 2007, 2008, we saw a retrenchment and a reversion uh, and a focus to trying to maintain control over the economy. Mm -hmm. Can I add mm -hmm. to that? And I think part of that reversion comes in the scarcity of resources. So when the economy was good uh, before the last round of commercial sanctions, it was much easier for people to participate in market activity and be more economic ind economically independent. One of the effects of sanctions, for instance, has been a lack of fertilizer, a lack of resources and inputs into the fertilizer manufacturing in order to provide fertilizer um, for the farmers. And so uh, their biggest chemical plant, chemical fertilizer plant shut down last year. There's a scarcity of fertilizer that makes it hard um, for the farmers to be able to produce at the levels that they were before. Um, and that, that means that there then is a bigger role for the state to intervene. And I think that's part of the reversion that you're seeing is out of the necessity based on how um, restricted the economy is right now. So Ms. Town, do you think Kim Jong-un now has a firm grip on power after his fear of politics so far? I think he does have a firm grip on power. Um, what I worry about most now is the high price of being an advisor and the high stakes of being an advisor to Kim Jong-un now because of you know, his ability and willingness to be sort of brutal in his decision making and brutal about um, the, the circle of people he keeps around him. And, it, mm -hmm. and Mr. Snyder, um, so what do you think is the biggest characteristic of um, Chairman Kim Jong-un's ruling style compared to his predecessors? Well, the thing that stands out to me about Kim Jong-un is that he seems to have a much wider risk tolerance, uh, especially than his father. Uh, maybe he's similar to his grandfather. After all, Kim Il-sung actually took the risk of invading South Korea to begin the Korean War, and that turned out to be a pretty, pretty risky decision. Uh, but, you know, Kim, Kim Jong-un has been willing to take risks in diplomacy, 
I think he's been willing to take risks uh, in terms of economic decisions as well. Uh, that uh, in some ways it's unfortunate that we see this downturn uh, in the economy that uh, he faces because those are risks that would rightly be rewarded if North Korea would also be willing to join the international community. Mm -hmm. On that note, um, Chairman Kim in his plenary um, speech said that even though we need favorable environment, we cannot give up our dignity. So is he rejecting the American um, proposition that if you give up your nuclear weapons, then you will have a better economic future? Yes, yes. <laughs> I think so. Well, in, in the way that it, it was posed to them, you know, I think they're, they're certainly willing and there was a willingness to go down the denuclearization road, but that doesn't start by giving up your nuclear weapons first. That starts by building the relationship and making some moves towards, you know, freezing the program and rolling back the program, but that's a long-term process. And the way that the U.S. had posed it was, no, you have to do everything all at once. And you have to agree to everything all at once and do a lot up front in order to get those benefits. And that's, that's not what they're willing to do. Mm -hmm. But that U.S. proposition was built upon the previous failures of going step by step and incrementally. So do you, what is, what is your take about U.S. Um, proposition to North Korea? Well, I think that the U.S. is trying to keep open a negotiated pathway to denuclearization. Uh, but the big question that we have to ask at this point, as we look back on our experience with Kim Jong-un, is was there an opportunity to, to miss? And as I think back on it, I never saw the moment when I felt that Kim Jong-un had put enough on the table to be able to say that on the U.S. side we actually missed an opportunity. It's a debatable proposition. Mm -hmm. uh, I think many South Koreans would say there was an opportunity to miss. But I, at this stage, am feeling like we never saw it. Mm -hmm. I want to know if Jenny thinks there was a missed opportunity. I absolutely think there was a missed opportunity, and not necessarily in what they were willing to offer unilaterally in order to get the negotiations going. But if you look at the way that Kim Jong-un has approached this issue domestically, they did a lot. They, they stopped talking bad about South Korea. They stopped talking bad about the U.S. They, actually talked about denuclearization, he actually talked about a commitment towards denuclearization to the North Korean people. If, you know, laying the foundation for them to go in a very different direction. And I think those were hugely missed signals by the U.S. and really undervalued in, in what that actually meant for him taking that risk of here, we've now suffered, the country has suffered in order to get nuclear weapons to turn around and say like, no, we're actually committed to giving them up now. Mm -hmm. But um, Mr. Snyder, didn't North Korea take all North Korea's actions were reversible actions, insignificant actions? In terms of the, well, what we don't know is whether those were, so the, the, the case that the North Koreans are currently making uh, is uh, that they took bold uh, unilateral actions and they were not reciprocated. Right. Uh, but at the time, they didn't really tell us what they wanted in terms of reciprocation. And also, as you said, the actions that they took were, I think, in the view of the international community, partial and reversible. So they were not quite as serious as we might have liked to see. Mm -hmm. We'll have to leave it here and now move on to our next segment. Now time for the photo moment, time to look at an interesting North Korea picture. Today we have a photo of people taking part in a rally at the Kim Il-sung Square in Pyongyang to carry out the important tasks set forth at the Workers' Party plenary meeting. The slogan here reads, let's push through all the obstacles, revolutionary spirit, willing to risk life to accomplish goals. Mr. Snyder? Well, the uh, machine of political mobilization is still very active in North Korea, mm -hmm. uh, and this, I think, is a very uh, solid representation of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I, I absolutely agree, and I, I think it really, again, underscores this notion that um, you know, Kim Jong-un talked about in his plenum speech that they're basically now learning to live with the conditions that they're in, and I think they have little hope that those conditions are going to change anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. Ms. Town, Mr. Snyder, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And this was Washington Talk from the Voice of America, and I'm Eun Jung Cho. Join us next week for more analysis on North Korea.